Hello and um, welcome to the IRDR lecture on the analytical hierarchy process. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Joanna Four Walker and I'll be your lecturer today. So the analytical hierarchy process or AHP as it's commonly referred to, and I may refer to it as the AHP throughout if, if I forget to say the name in full, is a method for making decisions. It's a quantitative method and it relies on, on maths. And it's a way that means that we can make optimum decisions because that's what we want to do. So let's say, for example, you wanted to choose what job you wanted to do and you had three fantastic job offers and they had different merits. Some of them were better than others based on different criteria. And you wanted to make a decision, which job should I select? Now, you could just do it from a gut feeling or something like that, or you could really try and analyze it and think about what are your priorities. So let's think about what different criteria you make, may have. You may want to worry about the salary. How much are you going to be paid? You might want to consider how close it is to where you live. You may want to consider intellectual stimulation um, and, and various other things, colleagues, your boss. There may be many factors that you want to consider. These different criteria may be more or less important to you. So salary may be more important than your boss or proximity to home may be more important than comfort of the office, whatever uh, criteria you're implying. So what you want to do is weight these different criteria on how important you think they are. So you can actually then assign weights to these different criteria to see which are more important. You can then take your job offers and you can score each of them in the different criteria that you've given. And then you can multiply your scores by the weights and overall decide which is the best job for you. You could also apply this, say you wanted to go and buy a new computer and you want to look at criteria like cost, size, weight, resolution of screen, and again, think which is more important, score each of the choices and make an optimum decision on buying them. So this is a method for making good decisions, but it's a way of bringing in perhaps subjective criteria. So you might have to apply scores to things which aren't necessarily quantitative. It might be that you're assigning a score, you're judging how something is better than another or not. This is really useful as a technique, for example, when we want to look at expert opinion on what would be the optimum solution to a problem. And today I'm going to apply this process, the analytical hierarchy process, to looking at the suitability of using school buildings as evacuation shelters in the Philippines. I'm going to go through the different steps of the analytical hierarchy process with you in detail. And I hope by doing that, you will actually then be able to apply it yourself if you want to. So many of our students, for example, end up doing independent projects where perhaps they want to combine expert opinion or they want to look at an optimal solution or maybe they have qualitative data that they want to then compare in a quantitative uh, way. So this could be a process that you could use applying to that kind of data. I'm not gonna go through all the individual steps of the maths. I'll explain what we do, but I'm not gonna explain the details. Don't worry if you don't understand all the maths at this point. Don't worry if there are a couple of methods that you're less familiar with. Either you don't need them because the idea really is to understand the process and the thinking behind it. Or if you do need them, we can learn about the maths at a later date when you come to do your independent project. So as I mentioned, this is a methodology for creating um, an index for making decisions. And the example I'm going to use comparing different schools in the Philippines. So at this point, don't worry if there are a couple of methods that you're less familiar with. Either you don't need them because the idea really. So let's take a look at our first um, example here. Looking at schools as evacuation shelters in the Philippines. So let's consider, um, for example, in the Philippines, that schools are actually sometimes used as evacuation shelters following disasters. Here are some photos from after a flood 
Um, and you can take this example of where people have had to go into a school building in, because they needed to evacuate from their home. Now, there is debate out there whether schools are the most appropriate buildings to use as evacuation shelters, because, for example, it might interfere with education and they're not designed to be residential buildings usually, and therefore they may not be entirely appropriate. However, they are also buildings which are usually built to a higher building standard because they need to be safe because if school children in school, those are one of those priority buildings, part of critical infrastructure that we protect and therefore put more money into creating strong buildings. Um, they're also a building that everybody knows where they are, or at least lots of people might know where they are. And they're a central part of the community. So there are advantages and disadvantages to using schools. There is a movement to try and not use them so much. Today, I'm just gonna focus on comparing the relative merits of different school buildings, as opposed to whether or not we should use, be using school buildings at all. So let's take a look at the analytical hierarchy process in detail. There are a number of steps. I'm gonna go through them briefly now, and then we'll go through each step in detail. The first thing we need to do is to develop a model for the decision. So we need to break it down into a hierarchy of goals, criteria and alternatives. So the goals are, what are we trying to achieve? I mentioned earlier, you might be deciding what job you should do. You may be wanting to purchase something. I mentioned a computer. Today, we're gonna to focus on how suitable is the school building to be used as an evacuation shelter in the context of the Philippines. We then have criteria. So how are we going to measure the different um, parameters that we want to look at? So when we talked about choosing a job, we thought about perhaps salary, we talked about proximity to where you live, comfort of the office, whether you get on with your colleagues and so on. In the case of losing school buildings in the Philippines, we might look at criteria such as how accessible is it? Can people get there? What are the living conditions like when you're actually there? Can you get access to supplies? How safe is the building? And so on. So these are the different ways in which you can look at how suitable the building is. And then finally, we have the alternatives. So these are your choices, the different jobs on offer, the different computers you can buy in the store, or in this case, the different buildings available that could be used as evacuation shelters. The next step is to derive priorities, which are essentially weights for the different criteria. So how important is one criteria relative to another? Are they all equally important or are some criteria significantly more important in your decision making than others? We then want to check the consistency of our judgments. This is something I'll explain later because it requires a bit of detail. We then need to bring together in our model synthesis the scores for the different um, options or the different alternatives with the weights of each criteria to establish the relative ranking of the alternatives. So all this means really is we're multiplying the weights for each criteria times the score you've given for each of these criteria for each option, add them all up, and then we've got a score for each alternative and we can see what's optimal for us. We do want to perform sensitivity analysis on the results. So what if we slightly change our scores or what if we moderately changed our criteria Things like that, because you may have not been sure, you know, it might be, um, you know, what if that was a little bit more important? What if that was a little bit less important? Would that have made a difference to your decision? So we perform a sensitivity analysis to see, you know, how likely would your decision be to change? We can also look at sensitivity analysis in terms of if we went to a group of experts and combined our results, how important are particular individuals to the final results? You know, would they change if we added one more person? Would it change dramatically if we took away a couple of the opinions? Because you want to try and have a stable result if, if that's what you're after. Then finally, we need to make a decision. This might be which job to take, which computer to buy, which building to use as an evacuation shelter. But it can also be used for more than that. It's not, doesn't just have to be a this one or that one. And what I will hopefully get onto later is saying that we can also use this method to see, well, where could we improve? Why was it one of our alternatives scored lowly? And if it did score low, how could we perhaps increase its score? So which criteria did it not do so well in? And are there ways we could make it better? So 
it's a useful method for making a uh, method for making decisions, but also for then improved decision making, and it can be an iterative process as well. So let's go through these different parts in turn. So the first, develop a model for the decision. Break it down into a hierarchy of goals, criteria, and alternatives. I'm now gonna start talking about a paper by Alexandra Tisloo, um, a colleague of mine, and I'm also an author on there. So all the results here are from that paper in Natural Hazards. We took the example of the school buildings as uh, evacuation shelters, and we looked at the first level of criteria. What are the different criteria that would make a school building more or less suitable as an evacuation shelter? So we looked here, you can see at the hazard at the location. So how likely are we to get shaking, flood, or high wind? The physical vulnerability, how safe is the building? How likely is it to fall down? The accessibility, can people get there? Communications, telephone, radio, internet, can they communicate with people once there so that things can be coordinated? What is the living environment? You know, what is it actually like for people once they're there? We need to save lives. We need people to go to evacuation shelters if the evacuation shelter is safer than their home in the event of a disaster. But if it's not suitable once there, if it's not an okay place to be, people might not want to go and therefore make, may not make the most optimum decision in terms of safety. We also want to make sure people don't prematurely leave if it's not safe to do so. So the living environment can be important. We also want to consider access to supplies, water, medicine, and other supplies that people might need in the event of an emergency. Many of these criteria can actually be broken down to into a second level. So it's not just the topic as a whole, but now we break them down and have a look at the different elements that break up these criteria. And we can do this at several levels. And here we go down to level five in the case of some of the criteria. So here is our hierarchy of criteria. We also want to consider our goals, criteria and alternatives. So our goal is the use as an evacuation shelter. Our criteria are what has been shown already. And then finally we have our alternatives. So the different school buildings and what we can use. We now want to derive our priorities or weights for the criteria. And this is gonna be the main topic of how we do this. So let's consider we have our different criteria and what do we want to do with them? Well, first of all, we make for each level, we make a series of pairwise comparisons. So in pairwise comparisons, what we do is take two of the elements within a layer. So for example, in level one, we will compare two of these elements and consider them as a pair and think how much more important is one compared to the other? So hazard at location versus physical vulnerability. Do we think they're of equal importance or is one more important than the other? We'll then do the same for physical vulnerability and accessibility, accessibility and communications and so on until we've looked at all the different combinations of pairs within that level. And we will do this for each set of criteria at each level. So for each of these um, areas that I'm circling, we will do the pairwise comparisons. I mentioned then uh, looking at these pairwise comparisons where we compare two different criteria. And we really want to think about how much more important is one than the other. Different scales can be used. Um, here we use a scale of up to nine um, that we can use. So one would mean they're equally important. Five would mean one was five times more important than another. Nine, nine times more important. Hopefully you're seeing the pattern. You can use a numeric pattern like this, but we can also define this in a more qualitative way where you might look at it being equally important, a bit more important, much more important, a qualitative scale as well, because in some contexts saying five times more important or eight times more important might not have such the same meaning as a more qualitative scale. So you pick what's appropriate for the problem you're doing. In our case, when we were looking at these um, school buildings as evacuation shelter potential, we actually wanted to go out to get an opinion from a variety of experts. So we set up a survey and we had 30 experts coming back to us and looking at going through every pairwise comparison and saying which they thought was more or less important. 
Here, I'm just using a dummy example. So this isn't from any individual survey where we just show that how they might go about it, where we see for the case of the evacuation shelter at level one, they would select what did they think was the most important of the criteria at level one. And then for each of the other criteria, they would say how much more important did they think this was than those. Then at the next level, which are whatever they chose as the next more important, they would do pairwise comparisons again and again and so on. As I said, this is just a set of dummy uh, data. But each time they can see the scale and they will go through this for every level. So it's quite an intensive uh, survey for people to complete. I mentioned we went to a series of experts um, and I just wanted to show you the demographics of the people who we were surveying. So they included people from different sectors of work with different expertise. Note that some people might have more than one area of work and they might have several expertise. So the percentages will come to more than 100. But you can see in terms of who we went to in terms of their work, we looked at people from academia, NGOs, government, the private sector and international organizations. And in terms of subjects, we had people from a wide range of um, subjects relating to disaster risk reduction. And this was really to help us, one, make sure we're getting a holistic viewpoint, but also later to do a bit of a sensitivity analysis to see whether our results were in any way biased by who we have selected in terms of their backgrounds. And also to understand whether different sectors, whether that be work sectors or different expertise, might make people think about certain aspects more than others. So let's take a look at how we actually calculate these weights. And I'm going to use the example here in the case of accessibility, comparing the proximity to the affected, the transport options and whether or not it's easy to find. I've just chosen this as one of the many examples we could look at. So once we have people's weights, their pairwise comparisons, we can actually put these into a matrix or a table. So remember, we have these scales where we look at how important one criteria is relative to another. And here I've provided a sort of qualitative scale where one is equally important, five might be a strong importance, nine extreme and intermediate values along the way. You'll notice on what we call the leading diagonal here, that actually you're comparing the same factor to itself. So it's one because you have transport options versus transport options. So hopefully that's the easy part of the table to fill in. So we can do that very quickly. Then we would start to fill in how looking at the factor over here and how much more important we think it is from either of these. So in this particular example, as I say, these numbers are just an example. Um, let's look at the proximity of affected to the different transport options available. And in this case, we're saying they're three times more important. When we look at the other side of the matrix, we can just do the reciprocal. So one over the value we have here, because if the proximity to the affected is three times more important than transport options, then by definition, the transport options should be one third as important as the proximity to affected. So you'll have a symmetry, almost, you'll have reciprocals um, down the diagonal of your table. Likewise, we're saying that here, for the proximity to affected, they've put it being five times more important, so we can have the reciprocal there, and two times for the transport options compared to easy to find and half there. But no, we only actually have to fill in half the table, so we only have to ask the question once, which saves a bit of time, which is good. How do we take this matrix, how do we take these values and start calculating those priorities or weights for these different criteria? There are two different methods. One is the geometric mean method and the other is the eigenvalue uh, method. So let's first look at the geometric mean method. If you're not familiar with the geometric mean, don't worry. Um, you may have come across the arithmetic mean. This is where you sum all the values together and then you divide by the number of values to get your mean. So that's what people generally refer to as mean is the arithmetic mean. The geometric mean is sort of a similar idea, but we use it in different contexts. So to calculate the geometric mean, we multiply together the different values we have. So in this case, when we're looking at the proximity to the affected, we have one, three and five. So this sign here means we multiply them together. And then we um, calculate them to the power of one over n, where n is the number of elements. So one, two, three, there are three. So to calculate the geometric mean, we multiply one times three times five. We calculate them to the power of a third. So that's the cubic root. So think about if you had to the power of a half, that would be your uh, square root. 
to the power of a third is your cubic root and so on. You just say to the power of four, power of five, if you have more. Um, so here, the cubic root of one times three times five, which is 15, is 2.47. I don't worry, I didn't do it in my head. I did it on a calculator. So, you know, we can, we can put those numbers in a calculator and get them. So that's how we calculate the geometric mean. So for each of these values, we calculate the geometric mean. Hopefully, if you put those numbers into this equation, you would get out the, these values along the end here. But something we want to do when we're calculating our priorities or our, or our weights is make sure that they sum to one so that we've got a nice normalized result. So to calculate our priorities, which is ultimately what we're trying to do, we sum up our geometric means and then divide each of our geometric means by that sum. So this equation here is just saying to calculate the priorities, we first calculate the geometric mean. If you notice there, that's that equation there. And then we divide it by, and if you look here, this is actually the same. So it's just saying the sum, that's what this means, symbol here means, the sum of the geometric means. So once again, to calculate the geometric mean, we do the multiplication along the line. So here it'd be a third times one times two. We multiply it to the power of one over the number. So one, two, three, to the power of one third to calculate our geometric mean. We do this for each line. We then sum them together. So this plus this plus this makes this number here. And then we divide each of these by this number to get to our priorities. And by definition, the sum of our priorities should come to one. If you follow that now, great. If not, don't worry, you can spend more time on it another time. There is another method, the eigenvalue method. Um, sometimes you get slightly different results. In this case, I've actually got a result where they come out the same. So the eigenvalue method is generally thought of as slightly better, but actually in a lot of cases, they come out the same anyway. So if you're more confident using the geometric mean, just use a geometric mean. For the eigenvector method, and don't worry if you have no experience of matrices or no experience of eigenvectors before, firstly, you don't need to. We can use the geometric mean method, or if you do, we can go through the math in detail another time. So please don't worry if you're looking at thinking, I don't know what an eigenvector is. Those of you who do know what eigenvectors are and think, I love calculating eigenvectors, that's what I want to spend all my time doing, then you can check your answers and, and do it that way and see if you get the same result. So to calculate the eigenvector, we look at, we express our results as a matrix. So here I'm expressing it as a matrix A. We calculate um, the principal eigenvector and then the maximum eigenvalues, and we come out with our um, weightings or our priorities. And lo and behold, they come out as the same in this example. How convenient uh, that is. I'm not going to go through calculating eigenvectors and eigenvalues now. As I say, that's something either you don't need to worry about, just understand the principle, um, or if we want to do the maths later, we can look at it uh, in a, at another time. Sometimes, if we are just doing this as an individual, so say it's just me wanting to make one decision, then that's fine. I've, I've calculated my weights and that's all I need to do. But this can be a really useful tool for combining expert opinion because it's a way of going from sort of qualitative judgments into a quantitative relative scale. And there are two different ways we can aggregate, so bring together the results of a group. And it's really just based on the order you do it. So either we can do the aggregation of individual judgments known as the AIJ method. Don't worry, you don't need to know that abbreviation. Where what we do is for each of those values, so for each of these parameters in this box, we calculate the geometric mean of all the different people who have filled in the survey or all the different opinions we have. And then we then calculate our priorities based on those geometric means. The alternative, the aggregation of um, individual priorities is where we calculate the priorities from the individuals and then calculate um, the group priorities from them. In this particular case, in the example that I'm going through with the shelter, we did the aggregation of individual judgments. So it's just calculating each for each criteria where people have put in their weights, we calculate the geometric mean of each results, and then we get our single matrix and calculate our priorities from them. So what did we get when we did this method with our experts? These are all the different weights we got for these different criteria. So the values in these boxes are showing us how much relative weighting we should give to these different elements. 
So for example, if we look at our first line, we see that um, we're putting quite a high weighting on hazard and vulnerability, quite similar weights. And then the accessibility communications, living environment and access to supplies have actually all come out themselves of similar weights and all about half as important as the hazard and physical vulnerability. Then with each criteria, we have weights within each criteria at the next level, we have the relative rates of the um, different um, criteria. So for example, if we look at access to supplies, water is considered the most important, followed by food, follow, followed by medical supplies, followed by bedding. There are some quite interesting things when we start really going into these different weights and what people have judged as important or not important. So things like when we look at space, there's actually a fairly even spread between the amount of space you have and having multiple spaces. And the need for multiple spaces comes from having protection for individuals. So do you separate gender? Do you separate children? Or do you keep families together? Or do you have one large space for everyone? And personal security in some areas is something that people would really be concerned about going to evacuation shelter. So this is why some of these things at first may be surprising when you first look at these weights, but then we have to think more about experience and why are they important, more important or less important than others. And what was really interesting about this survey is we included a lot of people with direct experience in the Philippines, and we also had people with direct experience of being in shelters, working in shelters. So we really did get the inside view. There are some criteria which aren't measured here. So things like the human factor, the staff, because we felt we couldn't judge those by looking at the buildings themselves and doing our surveys. So there might be other things to consider as well, but these are the sort of physical parameters, but with a social view of the physical parameters included. So what do we do now? We've calculated our weights, as I say, or our priorities. That's the, the sort of meaty part. That's the important part. We want to check consistency of judgment. So, so what do I mean by consistency? Well, let's take a, have a look at the example we looked, saw earlier. We said that, I say we, the example said that the, for example, proximity to the affected was three times more important than the transport options. And likewise, the transport options was twice as important as easy to find. Now, if you were to follow that logic in steps, so if we say that the proximity is three times more important than transport, and transport is two times more important than easy to find, then logically you would suggest that actually the proximity should be six times more important than easy to find, because it's three times two, because it's saying that we go from easy to find to transport, we're saying that's twice as important, and then proximity is three times more important than transport, so overall it should be six. But here we don't have a six, we have a five. Well, how did that happen? It's because it's a human being making judgments. And when they're looking at these, they were comparing here, the proximity to the affected to the easy to find. And they said, oh, I thought that was five times important. They weren't necessarily checking their own consistency. And this can happen. Now you might get slight inconsistencies here because we only allow whole numbers. So actually they might've generally thought this was five, but maybe this was sort of 2.4 and this was 3.3, but we didn't allow that. We only allowed integers. So there will possibly be some inconsistency due to that. But there may also be inconsistency of somebody is just, you know, when we think, we might not think in that exactly um, calculated way. Some inconsistency is okay. It, we can cope with a little bit of inconsistency and we can still get a good priority of matrices, uh, sorry, priority um, of values. Um, if it's too inconsistent though, we, we, we cause ourselves problems and, and we would see the data is not very reliable. So if it's too inconsistent, we would either need to go back to the individual to reassess their weightings. That may or may not be appropriate. If it's a very long survey or if it's anonymous, it may be difficult to do. If it's just you and you're doing it on your own, well, you can probably go back and do it yourself. But if you're asking lots of people, it, it may or may not be practical. But how do we decide whether it's consistent enough or too inconsistent? Well, let's have a look at these um, consistency ratio. And that's how we decide just how important it is. Now, again, don't worry too much about the maths for now. I want to think about the approach and we can worry about the details of the maths later if needed. To calculate the um, consistency index, we calculate the uh, maximum eigenvalue minus the number of um, options times the number of options minus one. Just take it from me that this is the value for the maximum eigenvalue. We're not going to spend time on that today. Um, there are online calculators. So if you don't actually want to worry about matrix um, 
matrices, mathematics, you can actually just go online and put these numbers into a matrix and you'll get the answers. So you don't need to be able to do it. If you do want to be able to do it, we can we can look at that. Here, though, I'm looking at, at this matrix here, the uh, maximum principal eigenvalue is 3.0037. Um, the number of elements is three. So the number of elements, it's a three times three matrix. So minus three and then three minus one, and we get our consistency index. You might be thinking, well, great, what does that mean? Well, let's see what we do with it. We then calculate our consistency ratio. And our consistency ratio is the consistency index number that we just calculated divided by the random consistency index. And these numbers are actually just given to us. They've been calculated by previous mathematicians, particularly but Satai did a, a lot of work on the analytical hierarchy process. He was the mathematician who first um, promoted it, who, who first thought of it. So we just have these values. So when we know the value of n, we can just divide by the numbers um, in this table and they go on for, for larger numbers as well. So in the case here, we have three. So we divide our consistency index by our random consistently index number and we come up with a value. And usually we say below 10% or up to 10% is acceptable and more than that is, is less so. That's a judgment. It's, it's not a sort of really hard view, but that's generally where we go. So if you're significantly above 10%, we would say, mm, you've got a problem. If you're significantly below 10%, we can say, yes, that's fine. And in our case here, we're looking at about 1%. So we're definitely okay in terms of consistency. So we've checked the consistency. So that's one of our checks, making sure the maths works. Now, the next step is the model synthesis. So this is where we're combining the scores for the different alternatives. So in the case of school buildings, we actually do a survey. We went out to the buildings and we made judgments on all these different factors. So how much space was there? How many different rooms were there? But we also looked at things at how accessible it was. How walkable was the path? Were there lights at nighttime? Was there access for people with disabilities or who found it hard to walk? We also looked at you know, whether it was easy to find. So in a score for that, we'd look at signage, whether it was known. There's lots of different elements that were then summed together to create those scores for your different alternatives. For each of our criteria, we multiply the score. So let's say we gave a score of between one and five for how easy it was to find. Let's say the score was three for the particular building we considered. We then look at the weight that is applied to that particular criteria and multiply them together. And we do the same for every single criteria to get the score for that particular building. So we can then look at all the scores uh, across all the buildings that we have. And that gives us our, our model synthesis that brings us to get our ranking or our scores for the different um, possibilities. So for, say you're looking for your job, you've multiplied your relative ranking for your salary, how close it, it is to you, whether the office is comfortable, whether you like your colleagues, whether the boss is good, does it have a good reputation, whatever it is you're considering. You've multiplied it by, by different weightings you've put on these different elements and you've come up with a score. And whichever job gives you the best score, that's the one you choose. Or in our example, it may be about saying, well, which are the most optimal buildings to use as evacuation shelters? But I said, really, it was more about trying to identify strengths and weaknesses and where we could perhaps improve scores um, where there were weaknesses. We want to perform a sensitivity analysis. That's our next step. Um, this can be about removing certain data. So for in our case, we just randomly removed uh, different percentages of um, the people who took place in the survey. So you might remove half of the participants, for example, and see what effect that had on your scores. So are they stable? Or is it, you know, is it very, very varied? Because that would be really important then who has participated and how many participants you have. We also did a sensitivity analysis looking at people from different sectors. So if you remember, I showed you, we looked at um, what careers people had, what their expertise were, whether they had direct experience in the Philippines or with shelter more generally, and so on. And we did do a sensitivity analysis. Now I'm about to show you a slide, which is very busy. Um, and I do not expect you to be able to read the numbers, but I just want to show it to sort of give you an idea of where we were going. So I warned you before I showed it. So these are all the different subgroups along the top. So here is all um, participants. And what we've done here is ranked the, shown you the order um, of the different criteria within those different subgroups of what was considered most important and what was considered least important. And then we've broken down here 
by different careers, so academia versus non-academia, NGO versus non-NGO, experience in the Philippines, some experience in the Philippines, no experience in the Philippines, and so on. And then to the right, we've broken people down by their subject area. And I should say all of these were self, um, sort of self-certified. So people decided themselves what their career were, and they decided themselves their expertise. We didn't judge their expertise. They, they self-selected which expertise matched them, and they could select more than one. Overall, what's interesting is actually on a lot of levels, I mean, if we look at, for example, the supplies, every single group said that it was water, then food, then medical, then bedding. And overall, a lot of the other groups, we also see consistency. Occasionally, you see a very small variation in the order. But actually, overall, the results were fairly stable. And when we look in detail of where they were different, a lot of the time, it's actually where the scores were very close. So even though they show the order is different, we're talking 0.12 versus 0.13 or something like that. We also did lots of sensitivity analysis, actually looking at the numbers themselves. But I just wanted to show you as an example of how you can really use this to see if there are common trends, whether different groups of people are sort of highlighting different aspects. And one example, for example, is uh, quite interesting that vulnerability often uh, scored at the top as being the most important at the first level. Um, and you may think, and that, we're talking about physical vulnerability of the building here. So in this context, we provided all the definitions within the survey to make sure we were all talking in the same language, how likely the building is to fall down. And what I did, one of the things I did find interesting was one of the few groups who actually put hazard above vulnerability were engineers who designed the building. So it's not just people um, promoting their own subject or saying my thing is the most important. People are generally thinking about this in a, in a holistic way. The final step is making that decision. So which job do I want? Which computer should I buy? Which building might be most appropriate? But as I said, really our work was focused on identifying the weaknesses. And in particular, trying to find perhaps some more cost-effective solutions to making things more optimal. So when we looked at how easy it was to find places, we noticed, for example, you know, a couple of signs could make a big difference. And that's quite a cheap thing to improve. Um, and, and we looked at various other things, you know, all the different factors and where we thought most improvements could, could come looking at those different buildings. So I think it's a really useful tool where you can then say, well, what about these changes? And then go back and see how, how sensitive your results are to those or whether you can significantly improve scores based on those. So overall, what have we done? What has this piece of work um, involved in terms of methods? Um, I'd love to talk to you about all our results in terms of you know, improving shelter um, and how appropriate evacuation shelters are, um, and particularly in this case study. But today I was, it was very much focusing on methods today. But if you, if you are interested in our findings, then you know, do, do read more and I'm happy to discuss. But I want to focus on the method today. So today we really talked about trying to bring together perhaps sort of qualitative or judgment approaches and then actually come up with a quantitative way of making comparisons to make an optimal decision. And this is something that I think is sort of a, one, at the heart of what we do at the IIDR because we're looking at mixed methods, we're looking at um, social sciences, physical sciences, quantitative, qualitative, looking at different sectors and different ways of doing things. And I think the analytical hierarchy process is a nice method that shows how you can look at sort of more qualitative judgments, but actually compare them in a quantitative way. So, so I think it's a really valuable tool. What did we do in our particular study? We started off in terms of our surveys, we had to select the criteria um, and construction and make and construction of the hierarchies following the AHP or analytical hierarchy process. And for this, we used to decide these different criteria. We looked at academic papers, we consulted with practitioners, we looked at other literature and obviously our own experience as well. We designed the online survey to send out to our experts um, that could do the pairwise comparisons. And we got feedback um, from a pilot distribution of the questionnaire, which we sent to colleagues so that they could practice it and tell us whether it was easy to do, was it understandable, et cetera. It's always good to do pilot studies. We then distributed the questionnaire. We aggregated the individual judgments um, and made estimates of the, uh, of the matrix with criteria. We checked for sensitivity. We, we checked at the consistency as well. Um, fortunately for us, it was fine. We got, we got a yes at this point, so we could just go to combining weights. But if we had said no, we would have gone back and perhaps had to ask some people to redo their questionnaires as if they were inconsistent, or if we had you know, problems, think of a, a plan B. We then, on the other side of things, we were looking at the actual school buildings. So there we developed a school building um, system. We looked at a scoring system where we could look at all our different criteria and look at how we could actually score them. 
we used on-site consultation and we also had a lot of local consultation um, with people local disaster managers um, local practitioners and people who worked in schools as well to make sure we were in line with what local practices were and that our scales would would provide us alternatives you know they wouldn't all score the same on the same you, know, you want to get some spread of results and um, we designed the field survey so people could go out and actually determine scores um, we then trained and deployed a team um, to carry out the field survey for every building. So we had engineers looking at the structural integrity. Um, we had we looked at the hazard locations using hazard maps. And we also looked at the school buildings in terms of all the criteria we were looking at. So we had a team of, of field workers doing that. We calculated the score for each criteria. So even under each criteria, there might have actually been many factors that we had to combine to just get that one score. So there was a lot of combination of, of data needing to be done. And then finally, we bring those two things together. So we're combining the weights from each criteria with the score that we got from each building. And we use that in the end to make impro um, improved and informed decision-making. And in this case, it was much more about advisory. It wasn't saying, oh, this school building's better than this one. It was really about identifying where are the strengths, where are the weaknesses, and also to think about what solutions we might have, particularly in the context of what might be relatively easy solutions, what might be cheaper solutions, as well as the more sort of harder problems to solve. So that is a, a summary of the analytical hierarchy process as a method and showing you the um, how we applied it in the case of looking at school buildings as evacuation shelters in the Philippines. I hope you could already see how you could apply it to lots of different um, possibilities. So you may want to go and investigate not the suitability of school buildings as evacuation shelters, but perhaps you want to look at distribution hubs in another location, or perhaps you want to think about different possible methods for dealing with different crises and combine different expert opinions and come up with an optimal plan. Whatever it is, this may be a method that's appropriate to you. If you want to find out more either about the methods, so you actually have it sort of walked through, or if you want to read more about evacuation shelters, um, particularly schools as evacuation shelters and what we found, and then here is the, the, the paper that this all comes from. At that point, I will say uh, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please do ask. I, I will definitely have to rewatch this and <laughs> take more de detailed notes. <laughs>